nine different parks starting at Glacier up in the in the top. So you won't hurt my feelings if you want to beg out after a while to go see the Patriots at 830 or something, but uh, I'm going to just chug right along. Some of the parks you can you can come to and, and uh, maybe spend an afternoon and say that you've seen the parks. Some of the ones that we're going to start with don't fall in that category. Glacier is one of the bigger ones. Um, it's up on the Canadian border um, of Montana. Actually, it flows over the border and was one of the first ones back in 1932. It was the, uh, the world's first international peace park. So you've got um, a pretty big conserved area. The Waterton Lakes National Park is the Canadian counterpart or, or at the part that flows over into Canada is known as the Canadian Waterton Lakes National Park. They have an abutment of a recreation area um, joining it. The Glacier National Park is covered on the west and southern border by a national forest, as well as the Blackfoot in Indian uh, Reservation to the east. So nobody's going to be building any uh, condos anywhere in the area anytime soon. There's a lot of preserved area. Um, but that being the case, this is not a, a highly traveled area. The Continental Divide goes north to south through Glacier, and there's, there's only one road that goes from east to west through the park. It's, uh, it's a very special road. Uh, we'll get to that in a, in a minute, but you'll see when we show the scenery why, why this area is not very conducive to building roads and driving. The symbol, each of the uh, parks has a symbol. The symbol of Glacier Park is our mountain goat. Um, there are, there's quite a population of them in the park. Um, there are no firearms allowed in any national parks. And after a few generations, the, the critters that, that hang out there get used to not, I won't say they're, they're human friendly, but they get used to not having to run away. They're not gonna get shot between the eyes. Um, so they're usually more interested in seeing what you, what you brought for lunch um, and maybe you might wanna share with them. So you'll, you'll have some wildlife uh, encounters if you get up into the back country. To give you an idea of what, what's going on in, in Glacier, the, the small patch at the bottom at the base of Mount Merritt there is um, that's at 5,500 feet. So just to give you an, a scale, a magnitude, Mount Merritt at the top on the right is over 10,000 feet. So you're looking at a 4,500 foot vertical face. Um, that's the kind of scenery, that's the kind of uh, mountain peaks that you get in Glacier. At the top of Mount Merritt um, is Old Sun Glacier. It's one of 25 glaciers that are in Glacier National Park. And you might say, oh, wow, there's, that's a bunch, 25. It's really not, not very many. 170 years in, the, in geo geological time is not a very large slug. 170 years ago, there were 150 glaciers, active glaciers within the borders of the park. We're down to 25, and if you want to go to Glacier and say that you've seen a glacier in Glacier National Park, you got about four or five more summers before they're gone. They're retreating. Well, here's an idea. Um, on the left, that was, that was 100 years ago, and look at what we're down to. There's a, there's a little patch there is all that's left of, the, of this multi-hundred foot deep glacier. They are retreating in Glacier National Park. That's not to say that, oh, the sky is falling, um, climate change, global warming, sound the alarm, because only 300 miles due west of here along the Canadian-US border brings you to Washington State and North Cascades National Park. North Cascades National Park has over 300 glaciers 
and they're not retreating. They get more snow or en enough snow in the winter to offset what they what melts during the summer, and they're holding their own. So it there are parts of the of the globe that in fact glaciers are retreating, but it's not universal. It's not everywhere. It depends on the weather patterns in your particular area. Um, Glacier, as I say, there, there, there are not a lot of roads in it. So the main way of seeing the park is hiking. There's, there's over 700 miles of hiking trails. So lace them up and off you go. The thing you have to remember though, is that um, the, those white blooms that you see there, that's called bear grass. And you're in the wilderness and where you, <laughs> Where you see bear grass, it's an indication that they named it appropriately. There are bears in the area. You're not in a petting zoo. This is wild area. What I normally do is, is attach, much to my companions uh, who's ever hiking with me's chagrin, I'll put some uh, bells dangling from my hiking staff. Bears are not real confrontational. They, if they know you're coming, they may step off five or 10 feet off the trail because they, they hear you coming and they don't want to be seen. You'll go right by them and not even know they're there. The problem is if you don't pay attention, like these people coming down the trail, bears aren't stupid. They're not going to go rambling through the trees and the underbrush when you made a nice clean path for them to get from point A to point B. They're going to use the path. So if you're hiking on the path and you're in bear country, you you do well to keep your head up, unlike like these unsuspecting folks that are in for a big surprise in a minute. Um, the glaciers, when the the last ice age when it retreated, it carved out these magnificent valleys when they were um, on its way back up to Canada, and left in its wake are these gouged out holes where either the melting glaciers or the spring-fed rivers coming down from precipitation off the mountains have filled up the holes, not, not in the state of Montana, just within the borders of Glacier National Park, there are over 250 lakes. They're all over the place and they're absolutely magnificent. Um, you can go at different times of the year right back to the same place and get dramatically different scenery. This is the largest lake, Lake McDonald, which is right along going to the Sun Road, readily accessible. Obviously this is a fall uh, picture. They're, they're about our latitude. So they have very similar deciduous forests that, that change in the fall. They come back in a, in a couple months and winter's there you can still get to it, but now that the leaves are gone and you've got ice, ice is returned and it's uh, blue and, and white everywhere. So same, same spot, very different look to the place. To give you an example of what, what uh, one of the hikes would look like, Lincoln Lake is popular. There are two circles there, the uh, Lincoln Lake Trailhead right off of going to the Sun Road and then there's a dotted line that brings you up to the Lincoln Lake Circle. Well, it's an eight mile stroll. Um, stroll is probably the wrong word. Just to the first few dots of that trail going up to the top of Snyder Ridge, the trail climbs over 2000 vertical feet within the first one and a half miles. So it's, it's a very steep start to things. Um, you gotta be in pretty good shape to, to do this hike. But you get out to Lincoln Lake, and here's your postcard pictures that you can take. This is at, at lake level, that's Lincoln Lake. And coming down from the ridge up above is Beaver Chief Falls. So you can see the falls, but you can't see the, the source. Where, where there, what, is it a river? Is it, what's it drawing from? If you've um, got the gumption, and can keep climbing, you get a hell of a vantage if you uh, go, up, go up higher, that's the falls on the left and you're looking down at Lincoln Lake. But from up here, you get a view of 
Lake Ellen Wilson. That's so you get a, a twofer. <laughs> it's the lake up above that's the source of the water for, for Beaver Chief Falls that's filling, flowing into Jackson Lake or Lincoln Lake down below. Uh, Mount Jackson on the right there is climbable. Um, you should know your mountaineering stuff. There's a few ridges that are a little tricky, but you can, it's probably the, mo the most readily attainable um, in terms of tourist hiking of this, there are six mountains in Glacier that are over 10,000 feet. That's, that's one of them. So you note the lack of uh, crowds. This is peak visitation. This is in the middle of the summer. Um, that's about as scarce as the, as the snow gets. <laughs> the water, after a, a, an August day of hiking, <laughs> you may be sweating, but when you get up to these lakes, there's, there's ice in them. <laughs> it's very, very cold water. So when you, you put your legs in to cool them off, it takes a matter of minutes before your, your muscles start cramping up because the water's so cold. They're brutal. Um, and where you have the, the melting snow and stuff, there's, there's no shortage of waterfalls and rivers that are flowing down. It's, it's just tremendous area to hike through. Uh, the Valley of the Gods is an afternoon hike, get you up here, and again, you can't take a bad picture. <laughs> you get up to some of these meadows, and it's just glorious. You don't have to hike. You can, uh, you can take, they, they don't have mules. It's like the mule ride to get down the bottom of the Grand Canyon. You can do horseback rides. They have day trips. Um, you can take multi-day uh, trips out. There's a there are chalets out there. I don't know if you saw it on the on the map, but right near Lincoln Lake, there's a Sperry Chalet. Is there? This was used to one of the more favorite um, stops on the overnight horseback rides. It's pretty good size. It can host a hundred and over 150 guests, or used to be able to. Um, you've seen the fires in the West that have been going on. It's a problem. Um, this was a couple summers ago in August of 2017, three years ago, the Sprague fire caught up with the Sperry Chalet and other than the stone walls, there's nothing left of it. But it was so popular that they uh, started a fundraiser. <laughs> they raised $12, $12 million to rebuild the chalet. Sounds like a lot, but it's not real easy to get building supplies up where it takes you an eight hour hike to get up into. Um, they did rebuild it. It was ready in the springtime. They were ready to kick off the summer season and they never opened. <laughs> the COVID hit um, and screwed everything up. So a lot of the, I've actually been to 13 national parks this year in 2020. If you don't mind flying, um, it's kind of a good time to be at visiting parks because the roads are open, the trails are open. If you've been to the park before and you know where you wanna go, um, there aren't a lot of other people there. If it's your first visit, I usually recommend very strongly that everybody go to the visitor center on your first trip. They, they always have a 25 minute, 30 minute um, video. They have theaters. And, and they'll go through a, a movie that'll show you what there is that's special about this area, why it, it warrants national park status. And it's a good orientation. Those, unfortunately, most of the visitor centers and all of the theaters um, have been closed this year. So hopefully that'll, that'll come back. Um, it's not the only one. There's, <laughs> this is Granite Chalet. How'd you like that? That to put your feet up on the, on the porch and, and have your, uh, your wine at the end of the day looking out th at sunset on that mountain. Um, there's, there, again, no roads and very, very few buildings in the park. So if you do make the effort to hike out to these chalets, that's your reward. You, you've got this kind of scenery to yourself. But unfortunately, they can reserve now. There, there are only so many. Um, bunks in in the place and like a, a good concert tour within minutes of the tickets going on sale 
literally every single night of every month on the, of the summer gets sold out. So do your homework in ahead if if you're going to uh, try to reserve one of the the chalet spots. But that's not the only place to stay. You don't have to camp out. Um, back in the early days of the parks, when the railroads connected through, they wanted to entice the Easterners, the, the money bags from the East to come visit the parks. So they, they physically built a sawmill within the borders of the park just to build these magnificent um, lodges. <laughs> If you have 300 foot Douglas firs in the area, or, or this is the size of the, the logs that you have to work with, you can build hotels like this. <laughs> they don't make them like this anymore, but um, that's, the, that's the reception area in, which one are we at here? Uh, Glacier Park Lodge. And it's not the only one. Here's Many Glacier Hotel, still again, built by the railroads. This is uh, just below um, the other one. This is on the, the shore of, St. Mary's Lake. Look at the look at the interior of this one. <laughs> when they they, just, they didn't do super eights or motel sixes back then. They they made it a destination, so that when you came, you you would stay for a week or more. Um, but they're they're just grandiose. That would be a fun bucket list actually to to go and stay because there are lodges like this throughout the Park Service uh, system. There's El Tovar perched on the on the rim of the Grand Canyon or the Awani and in, in Yosemite Valley. I mean, there's there's just a lot of old lodges like this to go and, and stay at. Um, the, there are day trips through some of the rivers. There are there are concessionaires that, that are uh, authorized to bring down. It's not anything that's gonna make you forget the Colorado going through the Grand Canyon, but if it's a hot summer day, it gives the kids something to do and they're fun. It's another different activity, and if you do an overnight, you can you can pull up on a on a section of the river where there's no one else, and you get sunsets like this to yourself. Going to the Sun Road, the the one road through the park. <laughs> it's it's where a road doesn't really belong, but back in in uh, the Depression era, this was a CCC. Uh, Civilian Conservation Corps Make Work Project. The uh, <laughs> they didn't they didn't have pneumatic drills back then. They had steam shovels. You can see the mountain on the right where they have yet to put a road through. Basically, they had to carve into the side of the of solid rock mountains to put a road in, and this is what resulted. Um, it's a fantastic drive. It's 50 miles long. My very, very strong recommendation is that you, you drive it. If you're gonna drive this road, you have someone else and they do the sightseeing on one direction and then you switch and you do the, the sightseeing on the other because note the lack of guardrails. <laughs> they, this is, uh, the road just drops off um, and there's, there's tunnels, there's, there's not a lot of extra room on them. You won't pass too many cars, but um, it's <laughs> it's a tricky drive. It's one of the most beautiful scenic drives anywhere in the U.S. You do go over the Continental Divide. Um, this is the best way to see it. Leave your car over at the visitor center and take the Red Jammer. These are the old um, the old buses that they've refurbished, and on a nice nice day, they open the tops up and um, Leave the driving to them. <laughs> you can you can be blissfully unaware of the the propping up. See the the architectural uh, arches that are shoring up. Like I say, the the road where there doesn't belong to be a road. <laughs> but this is your views. The wildlife you're gonna get your. It's it's not a rarity to see wildlife. The uh, bighorn sheep are curious. If you're hiking the uh, lower elevations, you'll get elk. Uh, this is during the, the mating season, so they're bugling. Bears, you'll see cars, when cars do stop, everybody wants to get their bear picture. Um, this is with a telephoto. This is not up close and personal. 
again, it's not a petting zoo. They're wild, they're wild creatures. So keep your distance, but you can see them. Bald eagles nest in the area. It's, uh, it's a fun afternoon to take a good camera. And we have our friend, the, the mountain goats. There are some parts of the park where you can go like this one, where this wall, this rock wall has veins of salt that, that come, it's like a giant salt lick, basically. Um, God knows how these, <laughs> these hooved creatures get up there, but boy, can they climb there. That, that's just a sheer face. And they get right up there to, to lick at the salt. There's over 1,500 of the, of the mountain at last count alive and active in the park. This is, you can't miss. This is, this is from the uh, Many Glacier Hotel the, out, off the bal balcony. That's your sunset over St. Mary's. So we're going to have to speed it up a little bit because it's already a half hour and we've gone to one, one of nine parks. So unfortunately, Yellowstone's not the one where you want to speed up, though. It's in the corner of Wyoming. It's actually the only park that that uh, bleeds over into three different states. There's some in Montana, some over in Idaho, but obviously the bulk of it is in in Wyoming. The white line are the roads. It's it's essentially a figure eight to drive around Yellowstone. Um, this was the first of uh, national park to use the term national park. It's pretty good size. Death Valley is actually a little bit larger in the lower 48, but this is over 2 million acres. So this isn't one that you come blow. It's actually three parks in one. At the bottom of the figure eight is the uh, thermal area. You see Old Faithful and the Geyser Basin. Very, very different from in the middle, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Totally different with waterfalls and rivers and cliffs. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, the, the northeast corner, the Lamar Valley, you could be over in the Serengeti. That's where all the, the herds of animals are and stuff. So within one park, you've got three very distinct ones. It was the first, and you got to start somewhere. So you, <laughs> there, there's quite a list of things that they used to do. Everybody that came early on wanted to get their picture, uh, get a picture of a bear. So the rangers obliged and at four o'clock every afternoon, they would put food out and the bears are pretty fast learners. They would learn that there was gonna be food and they would come around and everybody was happy. They got their, their pictures of a bear. Well, they don't do that anymore. Um, the wolves were predators. Um, they were dangerous. So they eradicated all the wolves, hunted them to extinction. They've been reintroduced and they haven't done that anymore. Um, they, the, the park service used to pump water from the thermal features to give the lodges running hot water. Well, that threw off the, the dynamics of the features itself. So drained the, the geysers and stuff. So they don't do that anymore. Like I say, they had to start somewhere, but they've moved on. And despite over 3 million visitors a year, there's actually more of the park returning to its native state than than uh, there was earlier. As roads come into disrepair, some of them are not re-asphalted. Re They're dug up and returned to uh, the natural state. <laughs> what you're looking at, the, the yellow border is the border of the park. The red circle is the single largest supervolcano anywhere on the face of the earth. <laughs> the entire park sits atop a massive magma chamber. And it's essentially a caldera that's, that's waiting to, to blow. Um, here in New England, it would take you 15 miles of drilling to go straight down through the, the layer of mantle before you would get to liquid magma and, and lava. In Yellowstone, it's barely two miles down. There's magma sitting right below the surface. In geological terms, two miles is right below the surface. Using modern technology that they can uh, look down and see what's underneath the, the, uh, 
different layers of rock now. They've, they've discovered the magma chamber underneath Yellowstone. I'm, I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon if you haven't been there yourself. It's a very, very big hole in the ground. There's enough magma sitting under Yellowstone to fill the Grand Canyon 11 times. <laughs> That's the volume of the, of the magma chamber sitting there. So if Yellowstone happens to blow, we're not going to have anything to worry about <laughs> because that's 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 a deal breaker. That that will be the end of end of the world as we know it. REM's words. It is a is a shaky area. There are earthquakes. They don't re register on the Richter scale. They're not uh, newsworthy. But there's two to three thousand earthquakes every year monitored within the caldera. So it is an active area. I'm going to skip over John Coulter. He was he was a, a, one of the original mountain men. He was on the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. And on the way back, um, they were heading back to St. Louis. And he said, the hell with this. I like being out in the woods. So he stayed and he caught on with a, uh, a fort, uh, one of the frontier forts. And they sent him out to the woods to make peace with these Indians that were raiding the fort. So he was the first one to get down to Jackson Hole area and, and see Yellowstone. Um, came back with these stories of bubbling hot water out of the ground, and they thought he was nuts until they found out that he actually was telling the truth. Thermal features, the first area of the park, is over 10,000 thermal features in, in Yellowstone. That's, that's half of all of the geothermal features on Earth are within the confines of, of Yellowstone. There's five major types. We'll go through them quickly. Hot springs, they're, they're beautiful, but that's not mineral colors. That's actually heat resistant algae that grows blue and green and orange and red and all kinds of different colors. It is a national park. You're allowed to go pretty much anywhere. You would be very, very highly recommended that you stay on the boardwalks in the thermal area. There's no way of telling how thick or how thin actually the uh, crust is. And this is literally boiling water. You don't wanna thrust your foot through and go into it. So boardwalks are cool. You can see, you can see the people to give you some scale of the grand prismatic here. Um, there's a lodge, a visitor center out in the background, but then you can go for a hike on the boardwalk and look at the size of, this is one, it's the largest hot spring anywhere in the US. The second type of feature are these travertine terraces. Travertine is a is a mineral like gypsum actually, and it forms. It you'd swear somebody carved these uh, terraces. There, there's very little that man can improve on that 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 improves on what nature has put in place itself. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, this is over in the Mammoth Hot Springs area. <laughs> Mud pots are fun if. If you don't have, if your if your sense of smell is not sensitive, <laughs> they they just sit there and they bubble up. They're they're pretty cool, but when that bubble bursts, it's straight sulfur gas. <laughs> That's what's bubbling up out of the ground. So when it does burst, it's a pretty strong rotten egg uh, smell. And they just sit there bubbling away. It looks like uh, something out of Mordor. Steam vents. Steam vents are where there's a crack in the uh, crust where groundwater or rainwater can work its way down to a hot spot. And then when it hits either lava or, or hot rocks, it, it turns into gas, it, it boils and comes shooting back up the crack and, and comes out as steam. This is the black growler, which is a pretty good size steam vent. Th these go year round. They, they just, it, it's not an eruption, it's just a constant, belching of steam, this roaring mountain, the whole side of the mountain is just steam vents all over the place all year round. But there are geysers that, that are a little uh, different layout. They have a, a collection basin underneath where the same thing happens. Water from whatever source gets down in there and collects and collects and collects. And then when it reaches a certain pressure point, Boom, it blows. Um, there are 
fewer than a thousand anywhere in the world. And again, over half of those are here in Yellowstone. So it's if you're a geyser hunter, this is the place for you. Uh, there's beehive glacier, uh, geyser. Not as reliable as, as uh, some of the other ones. It goes once in a while. This one actually, Steamboat Geyser is the, the largest anywhere in the world. It shoots up almost 400 feet in the air, but you never know when it's gonna go. In, in last year, last year in 2019, 45 eruptions throughout the year. That was up from 32 the previous year. However, before that, for the previous three years before that, it never blew up, it never went off. The 60s, they averaged 20 a year, and then it went dormant for 50 years, it never blew up. Then you get one of those, those earthquakes that shifts and all of a sudden the, the, the chasm, um, the collection, all of a sudden is closed off from draining and now it, now it goes off again. But you never know when it's gonna go. So you wanna see a geyser, you go see Old Faithful, very aptly named Old Faithful. There's le legitimately a, a digital clock in the visitor center over on the right. There's a gift shop and a restaurant and everything. Um, but there's a countdown to when Old Faithful is gonna go, gonna be going on. It's like every 67 minutes or 72 minutes or something. And uh, you'll have company. Um, I was there in the summer, one summer, set my alarm and got up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and went out, had the place to myself. It doesn't shut off just because it happens to be nighttime. So I had the very unique experience of being the only one in the audience. To, I had Old Faithful go off just to myself. And you know at 8 o'clock the, the tour buses are going to pull in and you'll be 20 deep trying to get your picture of it or, or something. I mean, it's very popular, obviously. This is a unique hike. Uh, takes you about a little over a mile to get out to the this section of the river. The river coming downstream is cold, but they've built a uh, a berm, a uh, stone wall that deflects some of the river water into a like a side side track. The water coming down from the hill side is boiling water. <laughs> so this is kind of like the three bears. You. You go up as far in the pools until you find your perfect comfort level where the mixture of the, the hot and the cold water suits you just, just right. It's, it's uh, kind of a communal bathing area, but there are not a lot of places that have natural hot and cold water. So it's, it's kind of unique. So now we go over to the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Obviously this is very, very different look than, than the uh, flat thermal area. <laughs> you have the lower falls that's twice the height of Niagara Falls. Um, it's actually the highest water uh, volume waterfall anywhere in the Rockies. This is a, a little bit further away. This is a point called Artist's Point, which you can uh, imagine how many people have painted this, this uh, picture. There's a trailhead here that, that goes, you can hike down to the bottom if you want to turn around and come back up. Um, but it gives you a very different view of the river and the canyon from down below. And, and it's not the only waterfall. There's almost 300 waterfalls in, in Yellowstone. I mean, you can make a bucket list just of going to see waterfalls. Yellowstone River, you can go on raft trips. Um, this I mentioned before is the uh, returning the land to, to less development. The Lamar Valley is where the herds hang out. Um, this is wide open, a lot of grassland, plenty of grazing for bison and elk. And there's actually seven, well, these guys aren't ungulates, that's the river otters, but there's seven different species. Ungulates are hooved, hooved animals. So you have the fastest land creature in North America, the pronghorn here. Bison, elk, sheep, deer, moose, goats, there's all kinds of food, <laughs> food if you're a predator. So where there's food source, you also get wolves and coyotes and bears and mountain lions. They get their elk steak, they keep the population in, or in order, the, the bear wants his bison burger, so he shreds up a carcass. 
it's it's a pretty unique area. It's actually the only place in the lower 48 where all every species, because we reintroduced the the hunted to extinction gray wolves, the wolves are back in the mix now. So now every every native large mammal exists in in the boundaries of Yellowstone. Very very different to visit the park in the winter. It stays open all winter. Uh, they get over 20 feet of snow, so you got to you have a very different uh, choice of options as as to how to get around, but you get very different pictures as well. There's your there's your lower falls. Um, you, they do have snowmobiles. You can go out, but the bison have the right of way. So if they choose to use your path, you you sit on the sidelines and wait for them to clear. And again, the, the geysers and the hot springs don't shut off just because it happens to be cold out, but you got to take your snowshoes or your cross country skis to get out to them. Makes for some pretty cool pictures though. Any time of year, that's the Lamar. So now going down south, out the south entrance of Yellowstone, there's a 27 mile section that connects the Grand Teton National Park to Yellowstone up at the top. Uh, Rockefellers, we owe big time for our park system. Uh, John Jr., when, when the Tetons were established and Yellowstone was up north, all of a sudden the connector started cropping up. They didn't exactly have billboards, but there were fences, there were homes being built and stuff. Rockefeller set up a dummy corporation and bought up um, unbeknownst to everybody, he bought up all the parcels of land and then turned them over to the Park Service and said, here, now, it, now it's protected, it's yours. So in, in return, the parkway is, is named after him. Grand Teton, back in the 20s, um, just below Yellowstone. This, this was actually the first national park I ever went to. Um, as uh, Jessica mentioned, I, I got off the bus here and thinking I'm a, a I was 14 years old. I was <laughs> a big, very proud of myself. I had climbed to the top of uh, Mount Washington and that's the tallest in New England. <laughs> well, the, to get off and see a, this is a 7,000 foot from Jackson Hole up to the top of the Grand in one fell sweep. I had never seen anything like that. And, my jaw just absolutely dropped. Um, I won't go into the geology too much here, but basically Jackson Hole was a fault system. Um, it dropped, the, the Teton range rose up. It used to be a four mile differential at 5,000 feet a mile. It was 20,000 feet difference between the valley and the top, but the, the great equalizer, um, erosion over the eons, 13 million years have worn it down so that it's only a one mile differential from the valley up to the Grand is a, is a mile. They're actually fairly young, uh, the youngest of all the American mountains. 7,000 feet straight up from, from the valley floor. There's your aerial view. That's the, the road going Jackson Hole. The, the town of Jackson Hole would be to the left, to the south, and then uh, Yellowstone's to the right, which is north. This is looking west at the uh, opening into the, the back country, which is Cascade Canyon. And you can hike around um, Jenny Lake. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, scenery. You, <laughs> but you're in bear country. You're, you're in the wild, so you got to be aware of it. This is driving up Signal Mountain, which is a series of switchbacks, goes back and forth and back and forth. But you can drive right up to this overview, looking right down the Snake River um, Plateau. You don't even have to hike to get to here. You can drive right up to it and get a, a great overview of the whole valley. <laughs> this is a, uh, a day ride out around, if you don't wanna hike around Jenny Lake, we, this was a horseback ride that we went on out to Jenny Lake. That's your view on a, on a, a no wind day. But you can cheat if you wanna get over there to the Cascade Canyon, you can take the boat if you want. It brings you right across the, uh, the lake 
or there's a, a circumnavigation trail that that goes around it at uh, lake level. <laughs> the elk, the largest elk herd on Earth. Um, you don't see a lot of them during the summer. If you go there, they're up in the high meadows doing their grazing and hanging out there. There's over 14,000 elk in the area. Uh, when the snow flies, there's Jackson Hole Ski Area, actually. They come down and there's been a preserve to give them a place to, to hang out. Uh, the elk preserve is right across the street. And uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's very different. They, uh, they're accessible if it's brutal winter, they, they can go out, the rangers can go out on snowmobiles and bring bales of hay out to them and stuff and help, help keep them alive. So it's a, a big help. The male elk shed their antlers in the spring. After, after mating, they drop their antlers off. So you can imagine what this area looks like come after mating period in the spring. You got to figure at least seven, half of half of them, maybe seven thousand of them, are males. And that's a lot of antlers laying around on the ground. There's one organization that's allowed to go out into the elk preserve and collect the. This this is one of four. That's my wife under the uh, one of the arches in Jackson Hole. This is the Village Green. There's a. This is the North Arch. There's an East South west and, and east, northeast, south and west arches. There's four of these. There's no shortage of antlers in the area, but I don't know, I can't see a show of hands as to anybody know what the organization is that's allowed to go and collect the, uh, the elk antlers. It's the Jackson Hole Boy Scout Troop. Once, that's a once a year fundraiser. They go collect all these antlers and they sell them to artists to make the, the big chandeliers for the million dollar uh, log cabins, log homes that are being built or, or artisans that drill holes for a cribbage board or you know whatever they wanna make them used for. Uh, that's their fundraiser. They have a lot of nice gear, that Boy Scout troop. The fall, that's uh, Aspen through the valley, they all turn gold. This was actually the view through a friend of mine's, uh, they, they got married in a, in a uh, meadow. This was looking through the arch <laughs> that they stood under to get to take, take their vows. How's that for backdrop to your uh, wedding photos? Um, can't, again, an area where you can't take bad pictures. Black Canyon of the Gunnison is in Colorado. It's in the western part of the state. Uh, it's right off the interstate. I'm going to go through this one uh, fairly quickly. It's one of the least visited of all the parks. Gunnison, John William Gunnison, that it's named after, was actually from New Hampshire. Um, it's it's called a canyon. Normally, our what we envision as a canyon is is broad and wide open and stuff. This is the antithesis of that. It's it's 1,100 feet from the visiting area here on the south rim across to the north is only 1,100 feet. It's it's almost 3,000 feet straight down. So it's long and dark. It's the deepest, most spectacular section of the of the Gunnison River. The river carved this canyon, and it's still actively doing so. So on the left hand is the south rim. You can see the the access road brings you to the overlooks. That's that's the view on the left, um, straight down to the water. It's called the Black Canyon, not because the, the rock is actually beautiful. It's gold and gray and uh, brown and stuff. But other than high noon, when the sun is directly overhead, the, the canyon is so narrow that it's normally almost dark. It's, it's black through most of the day. So it's hence the term Black Canyon. Um, gold brown. It's very sturdy rock. It it uh, oh this shows the the rate of descent. It doesn't sound like much eight ninety five feet per mile, um, but that's about it's more than ten times the rate of descent of the Colorado going through the Grand Canyon. So there's the river, and it's still at work. It's still digging down. It's quite a hike to get down there. 
if you if you possess the skills, you can. If you're a human Spider-Man, you can climb. The the rock is solid like the Yosemite granite, where you can hang from a little nubbin. If again, if you possess the ability to, there is a um, a couple of routes that go down from the top. They've limited to fifteen now. Um, my three, I have three boys. Um, Excuse me, my wife doesn't like me saying I have three boys. We have three boys. And our three boys and I, the four of us, were there in July. Um, we got the last two uh, permits to go down. It's very, very steep. <laughs> the, the rangers throw these 80 foot long chains around the base of trees to get you down. <laughs> well, to give you something to climb up on to get back up. When you get down to the bottom, the day I went um, several years ago, there were th three of us all day long. There were only three backcountry passes. The other two were fly fishermen and I never set eyes on them. They were off downstream fishing. So I had the place to myself, which is a fun day. There's two of my boys, Brooks and Galen. Um, this was this past July. They got the last two passes and decided to go down. It was 105 degrees. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a, a torture track to get down there, but they were darn happy to get into the cold water down at the bottom. But then you gotta come, come back up and it's, it's not an easy thing. <laughs> you, you get to the sections where that's the only way to get back up is to, to haul yourself. I was right outside the, the door to my tent and the, that was sunset. Um, beautiful, beautiful area. Rocky Mountain National Park. If you hit Denver and go to the north up, up through Boulder, you come to uh, Estes Park, which is the gateway to the Rocky Mountains. One of the most dramatic scenery changes anywhere on the planet. You know, you drive across Iowa and the cornfields and Nebraska wheat fields and everything's flat, flat, flat. And then all of a sudden you get to the end of the Great Plains and bam, there's a range of 14,000 foot mountains just loom up out of the, in the background. Um, pretty dramatic. Uh, this was part of the Louisiana Purchase. Very similar to Glacier in that there's only one road that goes from east to west. Um, a lot of hiking trails, 300 miles of hiking trails. This is why there's only one road. That's that's a, a depiction of what the mountain ranges are like. Long's Peak over on the left there at 14.2 is the tallest in the park. <laughs> um, Estes Park is fun. The uh, Stanley Hotel, Fred Stanley invented the Stanley Steamer. Uh, that would be the car, not the the vacuum cleaner, the Stanley Steamer. This was his, he was a proponent of keeping the area pristine, didn't want to see it developed. So he was a early driver of it being set aside as a national park. He built this magnificent hotel, which uh, grew in, in uh, fame when Stephen King stayed there one winter. It provided the, uh, the food for thought for his, his book called The Shining, um, staying there for winter. Grand old place, still operating. There's Long's Peak, obviously facing east. That's the uh, sunrise on the, the tallest in the park. You know, we have our, our quaint little uh, 48, 4,000 footers that every, all the New Englanders, oh yeah, I'm in the 4,000 footer club. You know, we have climbed of all of the 4,000 footers, which I don't mean to belittle the effort. That, that's a, a fine undertaking. Not in Colorado, just within the confines of Rocky Mountain National Park, there are over 100 11,000 foot <laughs> mountains. And 60 of those are over 12,000 feet. This is just within the park. So this is, uh, we're not, I think this is where the phrase, we're not in Kansas anymore came from. They call a park these valleys, these uh, meadows, and that's where you'll see your wildlife. They'll gather. Um, during mating season down there, many curves, uh, there's a parking area there on, on the road where you can look back down at where you've come, many parks curve. The, 
because there's only one road, if it 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 travels from eight thousand feet from Estes Park up to over twelve thousand feet to get up, it it goes up over it's the highest continuously paved highway anywhere in the United States. Um, you go from high prairie at 8,000 feet up to the, the Arctic. If it, if it snows up above, they, they shut off and you can't get started because you just have to turn around. If you can't go over the 12,000 foot and sometimes as early as October, that's already shut off. So if you're driving, you start from the east and it's a deciduous forest and you have lakes and mountains in the background and it's beautiful. But as you drive up and up and up, you get to tree line, the trees shrink, and then you go around a couple corners and all of a sudden it's, it's as though you got transported up into the Arctic, the, it, you're up in Alaska. There's, there are no, <laughs> it's tundra. There are a couple of parking areas uh, where you can get out of your car. And again, the, the elk don't know that they're supposed to be afraid of you. So they just kind of hang out, make for great photo ops. Um, this was a telephoto. I didn't really get that close to them. The mom and the kids hang out and they, they're grazing, they're having lunch and they, they let dad do the, the posing for the great photos and stuff, but you can get some pretty cool pictures up there. The visitor center is just, just below 12,000 feet. They actually have a, uh, those logs are on the roof because the, the storms and the winds up there are so vicious, so they'll rip the roof right off. So the, they figured a way to hold it on. You hike up this, uh, this little trail. It's not very far, it's like a quarter of a mile, uh, but it gets you to 12,005 feet so that you can say that you've, you've been up to 12,000 feet. Then you go down the other side that you've gone over the Continental Divide and then, and then everything on the other side. This is the, the headwaters of the Colorado River, actually. This is when, when it's just a baby. You can take a, a very gradual, a, a, a read your Sunday paper kind of raft trip on the Colorado up here. You get to the Western Park, Western Gate, Mount Baldy, and that's where your sunsets are over on the west side. So that's Rocky Mountain National Park. Great sand dunes. Um, over half of our national parks actually got their start as national monuments. I think 32 of the 62 started out as national monuments. And then over the years, either they uh, needed more conservation and needed to expand their boundaries or for whatever reasons, they got kicked upstairs. They got promoted to national park status. Um, Great Sand Dunes is one of the newer ones. It was just 2004. It got, it's, it's due south from Denver, but you can't go down the interstate, down 25, because there's no, you can't get there from, from the interstate. The Sangre de Cristo mountain, a 14,000 foot mountain range is between the eastern um, interstate and this doesn't look like much from a satellite view. It looks like a, a sand, sand pit, but what happens is the jet stream coming from the west as it goes across the high prairies picks up the grit and uh, and sand and then it hits these 14,000 foot mountains and in order for the air to get up and over it it drops what it's carrying and you get accumulation of, of sand. A lot of accumulation. Um, those are not potted plants in the front there. Those are 30 to 40 foot trees. <laughs> Those are 600 foot sand dunes, which if you've been down at uh, Cape Cod National Seashore or something and climbed the, the dunes, this is on a whole nother scale, 600 foot sand dunes. Madano Creek is cool. You can, you can be out in the middle of our country and have a day at the, at the beach. You can leave the kids at the, in the water at the, at the uh, river while you hike out to the dunes. It's a lot of work. Um, the hamstrings get a workout, but your reward is everybody, 95% of the people that go to the park are just there to, to ride stuff down. You can rent these uh, boards now right at the entrance to the park. When I first went out there, it was uh, back in oh, late 80s. 
I borrowed a kid's empty refrigerator box and carried it up and got inside to ride down on it. Now, today, they <laughs> he can cut an edge. You, you bring your own snap-in bindings and stuff. Um, it's pretty fun. You don't have to slide down. You can you can actually if solitude your thing. This is a is a good place for you. You can hike out. There's 25 square miles of sand dunes. You would want to bring a lot of baggies. Um, sand blows. It's loose sand. It blows. It gets into everything. Your cell phone, your camera, your your clothing, everything. Uh, this is going up the top of the star dune is the tallest anywhere in the park. It's 750 foot tall sand dune. And you can get a, a backcountry permit and, and hike out there and camp if you want to. Um, these are the kind of sunsets that you get because the clouds all bunch together when they're trying to get up and over the Sangre de Cristos and it takes good clouds to make a good sunset and they accumulate virtually every uh, every evening. So you're pretty much guaranteed to get some high, high wow factor uh, sunset shots. So if we drop down out of Colorado, we get to Carlsbad. Carlsbad Caverns, the northern border of New Mexico is Colorado. If you drop all the way down to the south, you, you get Carlsbad Caverns down there. Um, it's, it's actually the, the largest limestone reef anywhere on the planet. Um, the same Guadalupe Mountains National Park is in Texas. It's, it's like 40 miles, 35, 40 miles down the road from Carlsbad. Very different in that the limestone reef that once was the floor of an inland sea, that's where all the limestone built up. This is the natural entrance to get down into it. I was just there in August, actually, and uh, because of COVID, they had shut off the elevator. So the only way to get down into it was to go down this 700, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, 750 foot straight down um, to get to the bottom through the natural entrance. Normally you can take a, an elevator down and, and drop down and you would think, boy, I don't know, I've got claustrophobia. I, I do in fact get claustrophobia. And I the first time I went there, I thought, I don't know, 700 feet down, I don't know how I'll feel. You get out of the elevator down below <laughs> And it's anything but claustrophobic. The rangers are over on the left and your ranger tours line up here and there's a gift shop and there's a restaurant. There's, there's neon lights all over the place. The thing is huge. There's a big open chasm. <laughs> so don't, not to worry if, you're, uh, if you have any fear of closed spaces. This is quite the opposite. The first room on the tour that you come to is called the big room. <laughs> the big room covers over eight acres. I don't know what the, the zoning is in, in Chelmsford, but what's it, quarter acre zoning or half acre zoning? This one room is 8.2 acres of, of land. This is one of my favorite all-time pictures. This is a, a, a shot. You can see the dead center. You can see the group way up in the back, the, the little people in this picture. This picture was taken in 1952. I don't know if you're old enough to to know the, the uh, flash bulbs that used to go on the tops of cameras. You had, the, the later models had four of them. And every time you took a flash, the flash bulb would go and then it would pivot to a new side. Well, the original ones only had one. You had to replace them for each flash picture. This guy, Tex Helm, wired together 2,400 flash bulbs to get this picture. <laughs> So that they all, this was obviously before the uh, the cave was, at this point you were taking tours with lanterns and stuff. There was no electrical lighting. So to get a picture of the cave, he fired off 2,400 number two super flash bulbs, lit up 55 million square feet of, of uh, surface in the big room. It's never been attempted since. I just thought it was, kind of a unique picture. I have a poster of it framed. Will Rogers went down there and in the big room, he said, this is like the Grand Canyon with a roof on it. 
<laughs> that was his take on it. Now they have electrical lights that backlight all the uh, formations and stuff. But you can spend the better part of a day. Every formation, it's, it sets the bar as to what constitutes a cave. Um, if you've gone through Carlsbad, the others take a back seat. Mammoth Cave may be longer. Doesn't have nearly, doesn't hold a candle, <laughs> so to speak. Doesn't hold a candle to to uh, Carlsbad. Um, very, you know exactly what you're going to get every 365 days of the year. It's going to be 56 degrees there. Uh, doesn't change. Big. They they actually hold weddings down here sometimes. Um, beautiful, beautiful. You don't have to take that tour. There are different ranger tours. Um, the King's Palace brings you to different areas. The Hall of the White Giant gets you dirty. You got to have knee pads and helmets and stuff. Uh, you crawl through passageways, obviously very different. Uh, free climbing and ladders and stuff. There's a, a lantern tour that's led in an area where there's uh, there is no electricity or paved anything. So you get to see what early tours of the cave look like. This one didn't didn't tickle my fancy. This is the spider cave. They actually have a, a mock-up up in the visitor center of cinder blocks that you have to, if you're gonna sign up for this cave, you have to cr crawl through the opening of the cinder block formation to prove to them that's the size of the tightest fit on this tour. You don't wanna discover while you're down there that uh, you uh, are a little too large for this tour because you'd be stuck. Um, Obviously not for the, uh, hey, you can go on it if you're a beginner, if you want to, if that's your thing. Up above, um, Carlsbad is not the only one. Within the, within the confines of the borders of the park, which are 73 square miles, there's almost 100 caves that have been found, 94 of them. Slaughter Canyon, it has a different entrance to it. You can drive over to that five and a half hour tour um to go through that it's very similar to the lantern can there's no electricity there's no paved uh, paths or anything so it's a lot more strenuous tour if you want to go au natural this is an amazing cave lechuguia lechuguia is the deepest cave anywhere in the united states it's over 1600 feet down but this is not for uh it's not open to us um, you have to, it's, it's like a clean room. You have to be not only in the scientific community, but you have to have very advanced uh, spelunking degrees as well, certified uh, caving um, to go down there. They don't want it being contaminated um, because it's so pristine. Um, up above, this is basically the Chihuahuan Desert flows up from Mexico. Uh, this is the Northern section of it. The reason I went in August was because the only previous visits had been in January and February, and I had never seen the bats. The The bats are how the cave was in, initially discovered. Um, the kid that Jim White thought he saw there was a fire. He thought that it was smoke, but it was. But when he got closer, he found out that it was a, a tunnel of bats flying up out of the uh, natural entrance. Um, they winter down in Central America, and they're only up here in the summer, and I hadn't seen them before, so I, I went there to see this. There's an amphitheater outside the natural entrance where you can sit and watch the bat flight every night, where God knows how many millions and millions of them fly out every night. <laughs> I didn't see one single bat in August when I was there. <laughs> there was a, they're very sensitive to pressure. And there was apparently a, a low pressure system coming in. It wasn't raining yet. It was a clear night, but they knew it was going to, the, the pressure was changing and they chose to not go out and hunt that night. So it's not a guaranteed thing that you're going to see the bats, but go in the summer and you'll have a better chance of seeing them. So if you just drive south from, from there, like I said, it's a 35 miles south, the same reef, it's a marine fossil reef the largest one anywhere on on earth the yellow section is where the limestone is underground that's what has been eroded to form the Carlsbad caverns 
but the red section of this reef is where it crops up above the surface. So it's the same limestone, but it's up above. That's the Guadalupe Mountains. They're bordered on three sides by the desert, the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, Guadalupe Peak in the middle is the, the highest point in Texas. It's barely in Texas. It's just below the New Mexico line. Um, I'm looking at the clock because I think the Patriots are kicking off soon. So I'm trying to speed up and finish up here for everybody. Uh, the Chihuahuan Desert is, is desert. I mean, if you are into cactus, there's lots of cactus around there and stuff. It's sand. Uh, that's around the base of the mountain. Very, very uh, distinctive landmark, El Cap. Um, El Capitan is right alongside. If you don't want to go up and over the Rockies to get from east to west, and you're going to go the southern route, this is the uh, interstate that goes around the, su the southern end of uh, El Capitan. Um, huh, Nevada Bar. Nevada Bar is a uh, ranger, used to be up in Colorado National Park, uh, was a park ranger. She's an author who decided to write a series of whodunit mystery novels. And the unique thing is that each of the books, each of her books take place in a different national park. So they're, they're kind of fun. If you've been to the park and you know you, you, they're easy to get into because you, the books are easy to get engrossed in because you know what she's talking about. Oh yeah, I'm, I was up there and stuff. The first one in the series is Track of the Cat and that took place here in, in Guadalupe Mountain uh, National Park. Um, most of the, the large mammals have been hunted to extinction. The bison are gone, the wolves, the grizzlies, they're not around, but there are still mammals in the area, deer, javelinas or wild pigs in the area, peccaries. There are some black bears. This was in, uh, in August. Again, it was 105 degrees um, above the ground. Carlsbad was a nice day to stay down in the 56 degrees, but the next day I, I hiked here. So this is sunrise. Um, I got an early start before it, it uh, started warming up. This is what passes for a trail. You, you hike and climb and climb. The, uh, the cactus were in bloom and, and their fruit. This is the uh, prickly pear cactus and they make jelly out of this fruit. And it was all over the place. This is uh, going up Guadalupe Peak, which is up higher than looking down. It's looking down on El Cap. El Cap looks to be the promontory because it's at the end, but it's actually lower. Um, I wore those yellow socks for a reason because I was hiking alone. And if something happens and you're alone, you, you, you want the rangers to know. I figured anybody that had seen those, if the ranger said, did you see a guy? I tell the rangers where I'm going, when I'm gonna be back and stuff. And if I'm a couple hours late, they start asking people, hey, did you see a guy with yellow socks on? You're not easy to be forgotten if you have those. This is one of the strangest pictures I've ever taken. On the way up, at, at one point in the trail, this is a, <laughs> A family reunion of sorts, I guess. They're they're ladybugs. There's an infestation. I don't know what the attraction was. I haven't researched it. It was just a couple of months ago. I haven't really sought out the answer as to what the devil they were accumulating for. But they were in the tree on one side of the trail and the, uh, covering the rock on the other. There were just millions, and nowhere else on the entire hike did you see a ladybug at all. Just this one spot. It was, it was very strange. So there's the high point um, up at 8,700 feet. It's a good 5,000 foot vertical uh, hike to get up there. And that's from uh, down below. So the last one is our newest national park, actually. Um, White Sands was just upgraded in a year ago this month, um, December 2019. It was White Sands National Monument. It got kicked upstairs and it's now a national park. It's uh, maybe a couple hour drive from El Paso up to the White Sands. 
Um, it sits between the San Andreas Mountains and the Sacramento Mountains, I think, are, are on the eastern side. Um, the winds come from the west. They, they drain the gypsum. Gypsum is, it's, it's a powdery substance. It erodes easily and it blows down and collects in the, in the valley between the two mountain ranges. It's very similar to sand, a little, little odd texture. Um, the water keeps it from blowing totally away. There's water underneath the oasis. The, the water table is very shallow there. So it holds it in place. The southern end of this one drive that, that uh, Dunes Drive that goes up into the park has vegetation and the sands are, the sand, sorry, the gypsum is stabilized. But as you drive up north um, into the park, it starts turning into, it looks like snow because it's all white. This is the eight mile drive up into the heart of the dune field. They have to, they have this giant John Deere grader that comes by every morning because all night the winds have shifted the, the stuff and it blows over the, the sand, the uh, road. So to keep it passable, you're driving on the gypsum itself. Um, they clear it. So again, with the threat of another hot day, this is sunrise. I, I drove out there. I had the place to myself. There wasn't another car in the parking lot. And uh, I headed off on this loop. Uh, Alkali Flat, which is a hell of a misnomer because there's not one stretch of it that's flat. <laughs> You're going up and down these dunes the whole trip, and they're pretty good size. They do give you a warning uh, that there's no shade. You are out in the middle of nowhere. So I left the parking area and headed out. There's no trail because the dunes shift. They, the winds shift the sand and stuff. So there's my hiking staff. They, they have these trail markers that sometimes are up high, but depending on where the, the dunes has shifted, they can be almost covered up. <laughs> so this one had maybe a foot, two feet left and it was gonna be covered. I hiked for four hours I never saw another human being. This was right in the middle of, well, less visitation this time, this, this summer, but never saw another human, never heard a noise made by man. It was the most ethereal, surrealistic hike. I was, there's my compass that I bring with me. So I'm not reliant on, on electronic devices like a GPS or something. Um, it was the only thing I, I had with me to, to show you the scale. There were no other people to take a picture of or anything. I just hiked and hiked and hiked. And this is what you get out into. You, <laughs> uh, it's, I haven't found too many other parks where you can be that alone. Um, it was a very unique experience. You just follow follow the markers and you get back to the parking area. Um, others had come because they wanted to slide down the, the dunes, just like great sand dunes. They, they go in the park to kids slide down on it. So I grabbed the, the hotel I was staying at, gave you free uh, flying saucers if you were going to the park so that you could go fly down. I bought that outfit up in Alaska actually when I was hiking on glaciers to reflect the, the sun, but it worked just as well down here. Um, it's nice protection. If you happen to be a redhead and you don't tan, you burn. <laughs> if you're going to go out in the in the dunes for the day, there are other ways to see it because there's warm air. Uh, they've got hot air balloon rides and stuff. Again, beautiful, beautiful pictures that you can. Uh, there is one campground you can camp out there, and this is this is out the front of your tent if, for sunset. Well, I'm sorry I had to scurry um, to get through everything quickly. Um, my fault for the slowdown at the beginning, but I'm not in a hurry. Anybody that has questions, I'm, I, I never tire of talking of parks, so I'm glad to stay and, uh, and field questions if there are any. Is Jessica with us or did she get tired of my, uh, <laughs> my, my yammering? Oh, there she is. 
wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, amazing photos, really amazing. Um, let's see. Did you have any any recommendations for people who are traveling with kids? Which ones work best? It's well, I guess the age would make a difference. If they're in snugglies, mm -hmm. that's going to be a limitation. If they yeah. can carry their own weight, if they're teens. Um, oh, yeah, Yellowstone is sets the high watermark as far as a, a must see, in, in my opinion, um, because of the diversity. And some some parks, like I say, I, I spent well, maybe six or seven hours in, in White Sands. And I, there's only one trail in the entire park. I took my time. I saw it. I enjoyed it. But that's all there is. Yeah. Yellowstone's not like that. Yellowstone, you can spend, you could spend a week and never retrace your steps. It's over 2 million acres. <laughs> so if the kids are old enough where you can hike, get up to Glacier and, and uh, get out in the wilderness. You're going to see wildlife. Um, you'll see them up in the northeast side of, of Yellowstone in the Lamar Valley area. Um, Can you camp in Yellowstone? Oh, yes. Um, yep. They do have lodges and there are, are cities outside the, the gates with inns and hotels. But the campgrounds, you can reserve them upwards of a year in advance now. And it's really a pain. You, if you've planned your trip that far in advance and you know a year from now you're going to be there, you can stand a chance of getting a campsite, but they're few and far between. They're, they're hard to come by. They do have wait lists and, and people's plans change. So it doesn't hurt to, to jump on a, on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's similar actually from what we've experienced trying to get a uh, campground in Acadia. Um, yep, yep, very it's popular. About, <laughs> it's about a, a year in advance at least um at least it was in the before like you know before the pandemic and everything um but uh okay marie godla has two questions how much water did you carry when hiking the dunes and do you have any recommendations for lesser known national monuments nearby um water Shame on you if you if you run out because you know where you're heading. You know if you're going in the desert and it happens to be July or August, it's going to be hot. So whatever you can, whatever your weight maximum weight limit is, it doesn't hurt to come back and you still you haven't drunk at all. But to be short, uh, the cavalry is not coming when you're out there. Um, I skipped wow. over a story from this summer in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, just in the interest of time. But my two sons um, went down there. And, and again, it was 100 degrees. The ranger, before he would give us the backcountry pass, he went on. It was like he was trying to dissuade them from going down there. He went on about how hot it was, how you can't bring enough water. Um, you got to bring extra food because you don't know what's going to happen and you could get stuck down there. And he, he was like trying to terrify them. Well, damned if they didn't get down there. And, and my, my kids had um, extra more than they needed for water and power bars and, and food and stuff. And they had walkie talkies. They ended up I say that because cell phones, there's no signal uh, down in the in the canyon. We checked in every hour with my, my other son and I from the top, and they told us, listen, we're going to be a little late. Um, we've, we're trying to help another um, pair of hikers. Long story short, a guy from New Jersey and his son were down there, had completely underestimated the need for water. They were out of water, they were out of food. They were completely, they were in heat exhaustion. His son was getting heat stroke. He was falling on his face every second or third um, step that he was taking. They, they, there was no possible way they could get back up on their own. Uh, my sons gave them their extra water. They gave them food. Brooks 
happens to own a CrossFit facility and he literally phys physically threw the kid on his shoulders to get up that, that trail that's so hard to get up by yourself. He, he ended up carrying the, the son up because they were, they were not going to make it on their own. They, they couldn't get back up. Wow. Um, you shouldn't get yourself in positions like that, but, and, and they were in trouble. They, they were damn lucky that my sons happened to have come along because they might, my, my two were the last two down there. Uh, you have to check in when you come up. And uh, other than the, the father and son and my two boys, everybody else had already been up and out of the canyon. So if my kids hadn't been around, they were going to be there for quite some time. So the, I, I can't overemphasize over the, the need for water. Um, so the, that begs the question then, I guess, um, is there any other, is there any kind of checkpoint that makes sure that you are prepared to go well, you, on Well, you don't hikes? have to take the, there are, there are rim trails along the top where if you don't, you don't have to be quite so adventurous. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to bite off that, that challenge, then you, mm -hmm. you got to be up to it. If, if, if you've overestimated your abilities, <clears> yes, you can get in trouble. Same with that climb I just showed you, the, the Guadalupe Peak. It was 105 degrees, and there were not a lot of us climbing up there that, that day. Um, I was coming down at by 11 in the morning. I was coming down, and there were people just starting the climb. I, I just shook my head because they, they were right in the hottest part of the day, and they were going up in the desert, up 5,000 vertical feet. It was crazy, but... To each their own. I mean, it, that's the thing about national park. You're allowed to. They can't stop you. You can go wherever you want, but, geez, use some common sense. Yeah, you got to do your research. I mean, I've certainly been in that position in the Adirondacks before, where we over we overestimated our ability to get through a five mile hike with big backpacks to camp out. Um, in uh in the adirondacks before and and it just didn't turn out well so it's it's really important to check the guidebooks check all of the park sites make sure the trails are clear and everything yeah. the rangers are an awesome source of information mm -hmm. they can uh if you tell them where you plan on going they're they're pretty familiar with their parks and and they'll let you know if if eh, maybe that's not the best idea for today yeah absolutely the other question was, um, it, are there monuments? Uh, was that in relation to the parks that we were looking at or are you saying around around here? It looked like there was a, uh, the question was monuments around, um, any monuments known, no national monuments nearby hiking the dunes. In New Mexico, there there's, well, they have, Two national parks now, Carlsbad and, and now White Sands, but mm -hmm. there's about 12 or 14 national monuments if you're down that far, just below Great Sand Dunes. Um, New Mexico, there's a lot of uh, ancient Anasazi ruins, um, Indian oh, yeah. national monuments in the northern part of the section, so it's, it's not far from the dunes. Mm -hmm. Um, that seems to be all the questions we have right now. Um, give it another second. I want to thank you, Steve, so much for all of your time tonight and for coming online with us and doing this great presentation. Um, I already heard from at least one or two people that they've already planned trips for the future based on your they're your parks, your you pay for them. You might as well go see them. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm trying to give you an idea is, is the, the variety of things there are to see and do out there in the parks. It's, it's, it's not just a rubber stamp. Oh, ho-hum, another national park. They are so unique and, and the experiences just last a lifetime. Yeah, you do such an amazing job with these presentations. And uh, we thank you so much and everyone else does too. I'm seeing a lot of um, excellent comments coming through. And uh, yes, I will be putting the January presentation. It will be on the island parks, which will be yeah, excellent. Yeah, when we're sitting up here shivering uh, in the yes. snow in January, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna t choose the segment of uh, 
my presentations that cover all of the national parks that are on islands. It's going to make you feel nice so, and warm and cozy. Exactly. Um, so uh, January 14th at 7 p.m. That's when that will happen. And I will put that on the calendar as soon as I can. First thing tomorrow. So everyone can go and sign up there. Um, thank you again, Steve. And uh, right. we'll see you all next time. Great. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. So long now. Bye. Thank you.